Hi, I'm Diane Brady, and I'm Assistant Managing Editor with Forbes. And thank you, first of all, uh, Secretary Clinton, Chelsea Clinton. We're here to talk about Gutsy. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to start because I, I'm so curious, as somebody who interviews people for a living, um, including both of you, I mean, you're, you're so used to being on the other side of the table. What was it like actually chasing down fresh material and uh, interviewing newsmakers yourself? We have talked a lot about that because it truly is different being on the side of the table, as you say, Diane, who is now asking the questions and trying to figure out the follow-up and doing the research beforehand, all of which you're so familiar with. I found it fascinating and hard. It's, it's, it's a very different set of skills. and. Uh, I don't know, I think we got better as we went, or at least I'll speak for myself and say that I did. Well, I think you know, we are such curious people, and sometimes- In both senses of right, the word. Right, in all senses. <laughs> and, and I think, Diane, one of the challenges that we got better at sort of protecting ourselves from falling into was like, oh my gosh, wait, that's so fascinating, and I wanna go down that <laughs> like stream of conversation, but actually I know that we're supposed to be talking about <laughs> like how one stands up to hate or comedy. Like it was, we did have subjects to frame each episode. And yet, of course, part of what makes all of the women so fascinating is that they're multidimensional. But it was hard to be like, oh no, wait, we are here talking about this and this is really important, even though I want to know about your pets. I'm like, I want to know why nature is important to you and like how you made the choice to like do A and B in life. And, but no, we have to focus on this. That, that took, sort of internal discipline yeah. and sometimes nudging each other. Yeah, it did. Well, it and did. there's also a lot of sharing. And so I'm curious about the degree to which, especially being out of office, being in a different, you know, mm -hmm. stage of what you want to be giving back and such, that those sort of candid conversations and, and who you are, did that help a lot with regard to who you picked? Because I'm looking at the list and it's, you know, it's it's glitter. You know, Kim Kardashian, Megan The Stallion, Jane Goodall. I mean, these are these are good gets. Yes, as well, we like to say. You know, we wanted to um, mostly have people that you've never heard of before, and and we succeeded right. in doing that. Mm -hmm. But I think it was also interesting to take, you know, some of those big names that everybody knows and go at it from a different angle. So. With Kim Kardashian, we had a serious conversation about her work in criminal justice and why she wanted to become a lawyer and her persistence despite failing the bar over and over again to keep going because she wanted that credential to do the work she is now devoted to, to help people who have been wrongfully uh, incarcerated or unfairly in terms of the length of the sentence for what they were convicted of. And you know, with Jane Goodall, you think about her being this uh, incredible icon. Leaky's but angel. To, to, yeah. But to have Chelsea just sit and talk with her while she was sipping her whiskey. Yes. <laughs> just, just, just to kind of create this cozy atmosphere with her, which was so exciting. So we took, obviously, the names that were well known, but we wanted to put them in situations where, again, their multi-dimensional interests and their you know, commitments would be viewed. Um, so that that for us was a lot of fun because uh, we knew them before, but this gave us a chance to introduce them in a new way to others. Now I know that I know the book, and 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 tell me a bit about the conceit of getting outside your comfort zone because that does seem to be the motif of what you picked. You mm -hmm. know, whether you're, mm -hmm. you know, the clown knows uh, everything yeah. else. I mean. Right. Um, is that essentially the message that you're trying to convey? Is just this? Well, do the, you know, the, the activities we did, though, Dan, were not our choice. I mean, we let our guests choose what they wanted to do. I mean, I don't know if I would have chosen surfing as one example because I clearly you did the surfing. I have, right? I have no skill. At least I haven't discovered it yet. Maybe it's coming. Um, and you know, we went rock climbing and we painted and we cooked and we danced and we did comedy and so we really did you know say to the people who were generous enough to you know share their time and kind of their gutsiness like how would you like to engage what would you like to do and so don't give us too much credit for doing those <laughs> well, things but I do think you're right in that we wanted it to be in a place of vulnerability and to have you know honest and candid conversations we thought that would be more dynamic and compelling 
we also hoped that it would help people think, well, maybe these are the types of conversations I could have in my own life with, you know, my, my mother or my daughter or my friends. Um, and so it is very much both because we hoped it would be kind of engaging for people to watch and also kind of empowering for people to then think about how do I get inspired by Megan Thee Stallion mm -hmm. or how do I get inspired by Dolores Huerta. Dolores Huerta. Yeah. Did, you know, did you think about picking political peers? I mean, how does, or did you try to avoid that? You know, we, it, it's funny because we um, started off with no preconceptions. Uh, when we decided that we were going to accept um, uh, the offer from Apple TV Plus, it became a real partnership. You know, they had ideas, we obviously had ideas. And so we began to, you know, work that through. I think that for a lot of the stories we wanted to tell, we didn't want to just do politics because that would be very predictable coming from me, obviously. And your earlier uh, point, getting out of the comfort zone, well, yeah, I mean, we want we wanted to do things, even though they were, as Chelsea said, the request of our interview subjects, we wanted to do things that were different, uh, that would stretch us. And I think it's fair to say Chelsea got stretched more because there were several activities that were chosen that, uh, you know, were not... You were happy to cheer That I was happy to cheer, yes, yeah. you on. But it was so intriguing to me, number one, to see what people would choose. But number two, to have more universal conversations. You know, there's something about somebody in politics, and I think most people go, well, that's not me. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I either couldn't do that, I wouldn't want to do that, I'm not interested in that. But if you talk to somebody uh, like Sylvia uh, uh, Valescas uh, Lovato, who took her abuse, her sexual abuse as a child, uh, and was traumatized by it and then found her path to becoming a mountain climber and has, you know, ascended all of the biggest, highest peaks on all continents. You, you take somebody like that, it opens a different conversation. So it wasn't that, I, I don't think either one of us had no politicians. That, that wasn't at all the case because in their own ways, a lot of these people are political um, with a small p. They're trying to make change. They're trying to contribute in the way that they feel most comfortable. But we wanted this to be a set of conversations that would truly invite a large segment of um, the audience into feeling like, oh, I, I get that, I understand I that. I can see myself in that. I can see myself in that. Well, there's well, something about a common humanity, isn't it? Because I do think about um, the fact that when I speak to a lot of CEOs, they lament, as I'm sure you do, these, this polarization of the country. Mm -hmm. And how do we connect? Where is the middle ground? Where is the mm -hmm. center at this mm -hmm. point? Um, what do you think in terms of, you know, because you've, and I'll talk to both of you about this, you've seen this polarization, you've witnessed it, you've lived it, you mm -hmm. feel it every day. Um, what advice do you have? Because leaders are thinking, what is the role of a leader? I'm in red states and blue states. Where is the common ground for me, the yeah. universal conversations? You know, I would have answered that question differently five or ten years ago. But now I do think, for reasons that are really hard to fully understand. There is one of our political parties, our major political parties, and the people who support it and who they support, um, seemingly at odds with democracy and at odds with the kinds of conversations that people used to have, even if we disagreed, or the whole concept of compromise in a democratic society where, no, you don't get your way 100% of the time, and neither do I. We have to find some common ground. So it's a, it's a much more difficult question, and I think sadly many people, uh, myself included, certainly members of the press, the public, the political leadership, has concluded that it seems almost out of reach to bring people who refuse to accept the reality of our election back to the table. People who support the insurgents who attacked our capital. Uh, we're kind of struggling to understand this. And honestly, 
it does seem to me that the best thing that could happen for the country and frankly for what's left of the Republican Party uh, is to defeat as many candidates that they have running now at all levels, national, state, and local, and force them to purge their party of the disease uh, that has unfortunately spread, uh, that is uh, undermining our democratic institutions and our rule of law and our truth, our common truth. So I think if you're in any state, um, you have to ask yourself, uh, do I really want to be governed by an ideological partisan minority that doesn't listen to anybody else, that doesn't solve problems, just engage in demagoguery and, and rhetoric of the most extreme kind? Or do I want to basically say, wait, we're serving notice on you. We're not going to have you in politics anymore. You've got to go and rebuild a sensible party in our country, which has always prided itself on going, yes, maybe left of center, maybe right of center, but basically it's that vital center that has kept us on the right track. I have to ask, because um, I did read today about this uh, Jared Kushner, Donald Trump wanting to arrange a meeting with you. Is there a room, do you think, for ways to connect? I mean, let's, Donald Trump wanted to meet with you, and let's say he didn't want to talk politics. Is that, is that, like, is, because I do think it's, it's how do we move the conversation further? And one of the things I like about the series you did was you're connecting with people on levels outside of their celebrity, outside of what, Right. You know, it's their common humanity and their right. common sort of objectives yeah. in many ways. I think, I think, Dan, one of the challenges, though, is when people don't recognize your common humanity. It, it's, I think, then impossible because that fundamental um, asynchrony and asymmetry is just, I don't think you, you can't kind of find common ground with someone who hates you, either because of your race or your gender or your religion or because you believe in science, or you you're believe in reality. Okay. <laughs> and so I just, I think, I think, um, you know, or the people who laughed about the murdered children in Uvalde. Mm -hmm. There's no common ground with laughing about someone's murdered child. So I, I think it is important while looking for places to find shared humanity and common ground on which to build and move forward, to not give purchase or permission or sanction to the people who don't actually believe that any of us should have the opportunities that we do because we're women, or don't believe that my children who are half Jewish should have the same opportunities as those who are like white Christians. Right? I, 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 I think it is equally important to also not attempt to find common humanity with those who by doing so would just degrade my own humanity and make my children more vulnerable and take us further away from the country where I want them and every child to grow up safely, equitably, sustainably. Yeah, you know, I think a lot about this because when I was in the Senate for eight years, um, I was a proud Democrat across the aisle proud Republicans, we disagreed on a lot of stuff, but we also did keep struggling to find common ground. And even in the Congress right now, like after the massacre in Uvalde, finally we passed some form of yeah. sensible gun safety legislation. Not everything that I would wish, but I gave a lot of credit to both the Democratic and Republican uh, senators who came together and said, you know, this is just unacceptable. We have to keep trying to find some ways to save lives. So even if it's splintered, if people are willing to work in good faith, and in the Senate, um, there was always another day. So you might not agree today with, you know, Senator X, but tomorrow you and that senator might be exactly in the same place. But even there, there are some people now who seem to just revel in insults and finger pointing and scapegoating. 
Thankfully, they're... I think winning points on Twitter is somehow the same as actually like winning progress <laughs> for <laughs> like their constituents. Right. Yeah, yes. right. So, so I, th- I think that we're... So there are some people with whom it's really difficult. That doesn't mean you don't keep trying where possible. Um, there are some people, though, that are beyond the pale. And I don't think it's, you know, productive. So what we need is to get back to where we have people in public life um, who, number one, want to get something done that actually helps people, uh, don't feel that their end-all and be-all is, you know, how many clicks they get on social media, but actually what they produce uh, for, you know, their constituents. And that requires a level of political understanding and maturity that I feel like we might be kind of moving toward. Uh, you know, after the Supreme Court uh, gave their decision reversing Roe v. Wade, you know, the first example we had of people voting was Kansas, right? Right. Not a blue state. Yeah. Uh, no Democrat has covered, carried it for president since, I think, Lyndon Johnson. But a state where all of a sudden people look around and say, wait a minute, that's not, that's not how I feel. That is not my thinking. I don't want to be, you know, part of a state that, you know, makes decisions that are blanket, generalized decisions for every woman under every circumstance it could be. No, we're not going to do that. So what we're seeing are more and more women and young people registering to vote who maybe in the past thought, well, you know, what difference does it make? But now they know it does. So we'll see. I think we're in an interesting period. I don't have any idea what's going to happen in the midterms, but there are some signs that people are taking this election much more seriously than they usually do. The stakes feel higher. Yeah. Yes, the mm-hmm. stakes are higher. Mm-hmm. Does um, being gutsy look different? You know, and let me talk about the generational differences. And again, I know you're speaking from personal experience, but I know that you've certainly devoted your career to women and children. Um, you know, let's, I think about, you know, some are born gutsy, I you know, and some have gutsiness thrust upon them. <laughs> you've got a lot of people you interviewed who have sought out the spotlight. Mm-hmm. Now they might be looking for, you know, what do I do with it? But mm-hmm. Um, how do you think Gutsy looks different today for this mm-hmm. next generation coming up? I think, Dan, this is something we've talked a lot about because I think the kind of raw material of you know, having your purpose, having the persistence to pursue your purpose, having the sense of responsibility to bring others along with you so that it's not kind of just you for yourself, I think kind of that gutsiness transcends generations and that we see manifested in so many different fields of, of kind of work and calling, whether politics or science or the arts or Depression sports. rates feel higher though now. But I do think I, it's know? different for young people today um, than it was even, you know, a, a generation ago and certainly, you know, gener- generations prior because of social media. And, and because I think so many people are trying to navigate kind of their, their private and their public lives simultaneously. And their public lives may not be you know, the glare of the spotlight that we live under, but their public lives are their you know, few thousand followers on Instagram and the few thousand people that they follow. And you know everyone kind of walking into high school the next day knowing what everyone was thinking the night before because they were all up sharing that. And then they shared that with someone's you know cousin who shared it with someone else's cousin. And now you have people like many states over commenting on how you look or what you said or telling you how you should feel about yourself. And so I do think um, there's just a different type of fortitude and a different type of focus that we're requiring of young people to be gutsy over time. And we're not doing a good enough job, I think, of protecting young people, either from a kind of regulatory perspective or a kind of digital literacy perspective. Uh, And I think we desperately need to do more. And I think that is important to ensure that every child is able to lead their kind of best, healthiest life kind of and to find their own gutsiness and also to help ameliorate the terrible trends that we see in anxiety and depression um, and and other kind of mental health challenges that we increasingly see are off the charts every year with young people. You know, one thing I think about is opportunity. You know, maybe being Gen X too, sort of seeing that next layer up and I, I would love to hear your thoughts on, um, since we're talking about generations and things like, you know, conversations around age limits in politics or anywhere else, 
do you think that is there a place for that and um not trying to bait such yeah. but i'm just curious you know in terms of fresh thinking mm -hmm. and such how do we frame that in a way that doesn't feel like we're telling people they're irrelevant or should exit mm. stage left I think it's a very fair question, but I also think in a democracy, and this we've always used to say, and I believe it to be true, anybody can run. Right. And as soon as you're age eligible, 18 in some places, or 25 or 35, you have the right to run. And if you're 70 or 75 or 80, you do too. See, I think it's important though for particularly older people to take on the responsibility of mentoring and make sure the pipeline is full. I started an organization after the 2016 election called Onward Together and what I try to do is support groups and they're predominantly young people who are recruiting young people of color, LGBTQ, women in particular, uh, to think about running for office at all levels. So they're running for school board or they're running for city council or county commissioner as well as state legislature on up to Congress even. And I think, so if you, if you have decades of experience uh, in the political arena, I do think there's a tremendous opportunity because what's happening now, and it used to be that I'd go speak at schools, colleges, wherever, and people would ask questions and invariably young women say, well, you know, how do I get into politics? I think I might want to do politics. And now what I hear is, no, I don't want to do that. I mean, it's it just seems so hard and, and everybody is so nasty. But thankfully we do have unprecedented numbers of women actually raising their hands. Yes, we right. do. But not you. No, not you. But <laughs> and, and, and yes. not enough. I and mean not I, enough. I, I had definitely a, not enough. I had a conversation the other night at, at a party I was at with a young young woman who was saying, I always thought I want to be in politics, but now I don't know. It just seems so hard. So I do think there has to be more mentoring and more um, almost intentional reaching uh, to encourage young people and show them how to do it and how to withstand what is yeah well, yes I do think you difficult. know a, a few years ago when we had kind of it's it's the new year of the woman women are running in unprecedented numbers it was still like barely 25 percent of mm -hmm. candidates for Congress were women and that was like look at this I'm like that's great that it's progress but let's not mistake progress for success I, I remember um, the conversation when you joined the IAC board, people said she's too young. And I remember the conversation being, people on boards are too old. Like if you're looking at That's right. seeing around the corner, we need to be engaging young people on a different level. I mean, I um, so I, let me switch a little bit because I know that uh, our time is, is, is running a little bit low here. And one of the things I think about is um, with the celebrities, these iconic women in particular, um, this, you know, the one dimensional impression we have of what makes them great. Mm -hmm. Did you know a lot of the people? How did you pick the people that you interviewed? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and um, did you have a sense of wanting to see them in a different light? Because, you know, you're a fan as well as, you know. Mm -hmm. we, we very much had hoped to interview, you know, a, a wide swath of people in some kind of specific uh, people and Apple TV Plus had suggestions of people they had hoped you know, we would be in conversation with. And I think you know, the honest answer to your question, Dan, is that there were some people you know, who we knew because we knew them had real um, kind of dimensions that we didn't think actually people who didn't know them knew and we wanted to give the chance for that to be seen. And then there were other people um, who I think we were both really surprised by in a wonderful sense of how multi-dimensionally were. And I will say for my, for me, certainly, and really for my mom, I think it was uh, particularly um, bittersweet that while we were able to include former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, we weren't able to interview her. And we were mm -hmm. supposed to interview her before she got very sick mm -hmm. and then later passed away because my mother had always spoken about how she had learned kind of not only as a diplomat and a politician, but also as a woman from how um, Madeline really did use humor so effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was so important that that be better seen and appreciated. And I hope that people will appreciate that posthumously. Mm -hmm. And I just wish we could have had that conversation no, I with think her. That's very, I mean, uh, do you feel, I mean, you both have a sense of public duty and, and responsibility. And of course I have to ask, since if people take out President Biden, you are leading in the polls. How do you feel about um, public office, you know? 
and serve not, them? Not for me anymore, but I'm going to do anything and everything I can uh, to help elect people who I think are um, real small d Democrats who <laughs> really understand what it means to be true patriots, not... You know, why small D versus large because I, D? Because I, I think that that's why I want to see the revival of our other major party. I want to right. see people who I served with, people that I worked with, people that I knew come, not them particularly, but people like them to come back. So I, I feel very strongly about that. And that's why I run an organization to try to recruit more people. And, you know, predominantly the people who come to us will end up running on the Democratic side. But we don't say... You know, we don't want you if you're not. We say, here are our values and principles, and we believe in those so strongly. But I wanted to also say something about the generational uh, difference, because it is real. And um, I'm not um, a native technology person. I mean, I didn't grow up. I look at my I mean, <laughs> three-year-old grandson who pulls my phone I mean, out of my hand and starts... And we don't even allow him real screen time. Yeah, I know. Like and, and it's like intuitive. Weren't you the long hand part of the book? Yes, I was. I was the well, long also, hand. And for, and for <laughs> years, she would sign her emails to me like, techno mom. And I'm like, I get it. You're on a piece of technology. Like, I don't need you. As opposed to techno peasant, which is... Or just, or just right. like mom. I mean, yeah. for years, I was like, I know. I know. It's You're not calling me. The fact me. that she I signed know. it, that alone, I think, <laughs> yeah. says everything. Shows you that right? I'm not. Yeah, Hello. I know. I know, I know yeah. your email address. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For years. I just need to believe that. But we did. We did. You're right. I mean, when we wrote the book, I did. I still write in longhand. Chelsea was, you know, derisive. <laughs> and, they, they have found a correlation with your bill. I mean, right? It actually helps you absorb the information differently. <laughs> that's what I find. Yeah, I really did. I feel like the, you know, the thoughts start in my head and they have to go down my arm and out my fingers, but onto a pad of paper, not a, a keyboard. But, but that was like one of the generational uh, challenges. And one of the people we really, really wanted to interview was Dolores Huerta, who mm -hmm. is over 90. And not only was she the co-founder with Cesar Chavez of the United Farm Workers, but she's been an activist on women's rights and worker rights you know, forever. She had 11 children. And she had raised those kids, and we wanted to meet with her, and we met with her and her daughters. And they had a really honest conversation. And that's what we want. We want that sense of, you know what? It was really hard. My mother would be going off, taking us with her to a picket line, or she wouldn't be there, and we'd have to make breakfast for our younger you know, siblings. It was really raw, and it was, it was something that we were so privileged to be a uh, party to, uh, because you know it's hard being a mother and a professional. We, all three of us know that, and, and I think so many American women, particularly during and after COVID, felt so alone. Right. I mean, there they were, educating their children, trying to keep them healthy and alive, dealing Working with everything else. It was horrible. Um, let me ask one last question, which is, you know, I, I, the Village Green that we're talking about, I noticed that um, the Clinton Global Initiative is happening yes. again, and mm -hmm. I know that that was put aside when you were running for office. Does it have a different flavor now? It does, and, and I have to say, it really was brought back by people begging us to bring it back because... It's unlike any other conference uh, that I'm aware of, where people are asked to make a commitment. Okay, come to the conference, meet these incredible people, listen to them, be part of it, but then what are you gonna do? How are you going to make a commitment that can possibly you know, help somebody or change something? And what we were being asked um, was to bring it back because people now are rethinking what works. You know, how do we make an impact? Um, how do we use technology more effectively and, and, equitably. and equitably and not with the negativity that it brings? How do we learn from what happened in COVID when it comes to public health, which Chelsea's an expert on? So yes, it was like, okay, we did, we did a lot of good work, but now we need to rethink how we do that work more um, uh, impactfully. And, and to ensure, again, that while it has a different flavor, a still real bias towards partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. A real bias towards ensuring that um, both likely and unlikely partnerships can be kind of catalyzed and nurtured, whether it's on kind of trying to expand access to vaccines or affordable housing. 
and, and to gutsy women, what are you doing to make your kids gutsy? We talk a lot about how, at least I believe, the two most important qualities are kindness and bravery. And, and of course, I hope that my children have many other qualities. <laughs> I hope they are curious about the world and hardworking and ambitious and all sorts of other um, Good cooks, dimensions. Nice to yeah, clean. yeah, you know, I uh, right, in, and that they know that sugar is not a food group, <laughs> um, or at least not a principal one. Um, but that's a, a challenge because my husband believes that sugar is, like, you know, the most important ingredient for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, but kindness and bravery, and that we practice being brave in the small things so that we're ready to be brave in the big things. And whether that's we fall down in the playground or we have to deal with someone who's maybe unkind and even bullying us at school, that we have to practice being brave. And I believe that it is through the practicing of being brave that hopefully they'll find their own gutsiness. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much, Secretary thank Clinton. Thank Chelsea you, Dan. Clinton. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank Thanks, you very Dan. much. Thank you.